Okay, our Veritas verse, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Very good, Mary. Hey, there he is. Come on in. Thanks for not knocking me down. <laughs> All right, so great verse, and we focus on that for the whole year in Veritas, Boys of Christ. Last time we did this, if we admit, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to I almost said it, forgive us our sins and to not just forgive us, but he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Very good. And that's a wonderful verse to pray quite often. Lord, I've blown it again. Thank you for First John 1, 9. Thank you if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of stuff that I've forgotten. And today's verse is Isaiah 41. Isaiah is an incredible prophet. God used in his book so powerful. He gives us, gives us so much powerful stuff in his book. Not only prophecies. Prophesied 700 years before Jesus was born. But not only good prophecies, but just great truth and encouragement. Um... And this is one of those encouraging verses for people who are struggling with worry and anxiety and fear, and doubt and distress and all that kind of stuff. So he starts by saying, fear not, because for I am, I'm with you. I'm here. Fear not. I'm with you. Be not very good. Dismayed. Dismayed, which means distressed. Oops. Dismayed. For I am your God. I will. When you're weak, I will do this for you. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will. It means to uh, lift up, maybe. Uphold, very good. Uphold you with my some kind of right hand, righteous right hand. Very good. Now, guys, I'm telling you, this is a powerful verse. Now, God's put a lot of verses like this in his word, and they're all powerful. But God knows, you'll hear me say this a lot, God knows every one of us. He knows that we're susceptible to stress and worry and fear and anxiety. And especially when things suddenly go wrong. That's what's when people get dismayed. When something happens really quickly, you get all distressed, you're dismayed. God says, you don't have to be that way. When I was younger, I've probably told you this many times, when I was younger, I struggled with anxiety. Until somebody suggested I memorize some verses like this one. And I started memorizing these verses. I wrote a bunch of them down and memorized them. And now I've got them on my website, a whole bunch of them. And if anybody tells me they're struggling with anxiety or something, I say, I was, they ask me to pray for them. I'll say, I'll definitely pray for you. But I'm telling you, the way to fix it is memorize verses like this and rehearse, re rehearse them in your mind over and over in the presence of the Lord. Get them memorized so you can go through them in your mind. And God will give you his peace through his word. It's very, very powerful. It changed my life. So this is well worth memorizing. So let's see if we can do it right now. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. I'm not going anywhere. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. And then a parallel phrase, be not dismayed, for I am your God. There's another four prepositional phrase. Fear not, for I am with you. Or be not, it's not a prepositional phrase, is it? What do you call that? Like the word because. I forgot my grammar there. You remember what it's called when you got a clause after the word because? Just a dependent clause, I guess. But anyway, this is the reason why you don't have to fear. This is the reason you don't have to be dismayed. For I am your God. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And then these three promises. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, with my righteous right hand, with my righteous right hand. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. With my righteous right hand. Very good. Good job. Good job. All right.
And I know some of y'all got it memorized already, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to write it down memorized. Isaiah 4110. Really, really awesome passage. Okay, anything you want to say before I pray? Are you praying? Father, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this verse, these wonderful promises and truths. So, Lord, help us to remember these things. Help us to remember what you caused your great prophet Isaiah to write. 700 years before Jesus was born, you caused him to write these things down to encourage us now. 2024, it's amazing. So, Lord, thank you that we don't have to be afraid because you're not going anywhere. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Thank you that you're with us now. Thank you that you're with us when we're asleep at night. Thank you that you're with us when we get up in the morning. Thank you that you're with us when we're looking at our cell phones. Thank you that you're with us when we're watching YouTube or television. Thank you that you're with us when we're eating our meals. Thank you that you're with us when we're hanging out with our friends. Thank you that you're with us at church. Wherever we are, Lord, you're there. When we're in the car, thank you, Lord, that you're with us. And thank you that whatever news we hear, whatever happens, we don't have to be afraid because you're with us. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to be dismayed and distressed and distraught because you're our God. And you're awesome in all your ways. You're perfect in your power, might, and strength. And you're perfect in your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. You're perfect in your love and compassion and mercy toward us. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be dismayed. Thank you, Lord, that you promised to strengthen us when we're weak. And that's pretty much all the time, Lord. We're always weak. Thank you that you are our strength. Thank you, Lord, that you promised to help us when we need help. And thank you that you promised to uphold us with your righteous right hand, your powerful righteous right hand. So thank you, Father, for this incredible passage of Scripture. Help us internalize it and learn it and memorize it and, and maybe use it to encourage others when they're struggling with fears and worries and stress. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to study ACT stuff a little bit more. Pray you'd help us to learn what we need to learn. Pray you'd encourage these kids. I pray you'd uh, bless the ones who aren't here today. You know where they are. Some traveling, some may be sick, some may be having other issues. Just lift them up to you and ask you for mercy for them. And I pray that we will be a blessing to you and to each other and to others the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> um, yeah, let's see. All right, we're going to do one more challenging section in difficult math. Then we'll go back and review some kind of basic math stuff. Uh, we did this last time. Wow, that looks weird, doesn't it? Did it? Anyway, we did that kind of stuff last time. I want to talk about this just a little bit more about these trigonometric things and give you one more bit of trigonometry. Some of you may have seen it if you studied trigonometry in any detail in, a, in, in an algebra two usually, but but uh, uh, and certainly in, if you if you've gone so far as taking advanced math or pre-cal or something like that. In the unit circle, uh, you know you can do trig functions. This this is the this is the angle. It's always a reference angle. I talked about reference angles the other day. This side over here is the opposite side. And over here is positive. This is the adjacent side. Over here is positive. This is the hypotenuse. So there's a right triangle here. And so you can use SOHCAHTOA, S-O-A, sinus opposite over hypotenuse. It'll be positive. Cosines adjacent over hypotenuse, it'll be positive. Tangents opposite over adjacent, it'll be positive. So they're all positive right here. I'm talking about, we're just going to focus on sines, cosines, and tangents. Of course, the reciprocals will have the same sign. You know, the cosecant will be positive, the secant will be positive, the cotangent will be positive. Don't worry too much about that right now. On this side over here, this is the, this is the right angle. It's just, and this is the reference angle, makes with the x-axis. And, and the adjacent side is now negative. The opposite side is still positive. The hypotenuse is always positive. So over here, the sine is opposite over hypotenuse. The sine is positive. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The cosine will be negative. 
So for angles between 90 and 180, the cosine will always be negative. The tangent will also be negative because it's the opposite over the adjacent. So the tangent is negative between 90 and 180. So the sine is positive, the cosine and tangent are negative. I'm going to move this up here a little bit so I can write down underneath it. For an angle down here, I just I could draw it right there to make it look symmetrical, but it could get confusing. So I'm just going to extend it a little bit. Here's my right angle. Here's the reference angle. This is theta. It's always with the x-axis. I'm not used with the x-axis. And this time, the adjacent side is still negative because I'm going to the left. The opposite side is still negative because I'm going down. And the hypotenuse is always positive. So down here, the sine is negative. Opposite over hypotenuse. So, this is negative. The cosine is negative. Adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent. But the tangent turns out to be positive down here. Because it's opposite over adjacent. And it's a negative over a negative. So the tangent is going to be positive. So for angle between 180 and 270. Or between pi and pi. And 3 pi over 2, if you're doing radians, the tangent is positive. Finally, if we do another one over here, this is theta, the reference angle, makes for the x-axis. The adjacent side is still positive, but the opposite side is now negative, going down. Hypotenuse is always positive. So the sine... It's the opposite over hypotenuse is negative. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse is positive, and the tangent is opposite over adjacent, which is negative. So this one, the cosine is positive. So in the quadrants here, in the first quadrant, they're all positive. In the second quadrant, sine is positive between 90 and 180. In the third quadrant, between 180 and 270, the tangent is positive. In the fourth quadrant, between 180 and 360, I'm sorry, 270 and 360, the cosine is positive. And somewhere along the line, students have come up with a A, S, you know, if you go in the direction of positive angles, which is counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, A, all, sine, tangent, cosine, and, and, and I've heard, you could make any kind of little memory device you wanted to, but I've heard all students take calculus. Uh, which is a lie, <laughs> but it helps you remember it. that that could help you to figure out some of those problems. I realize we're talking about more advanced math right now, and some of you, maybe all of you are saying, mm, it's more than I want. If I just miss a problem like that on the ACT, it'd take a hit on that problem. But, but anyway, they do sometimes ask questions that that kind of information can help you. So you might want to watch the video. Write it down and learn it if you're interested in Trying to reach a perfect score. All right. Now, do you know what I mean by a sine wave? I don't know if you've ever even seen this or not. But, and it keeps going, by the way. I'm gonna, I'm, that's one wavelength or one period of time. And on the circle, it's like one complete cycle around the circle. So this would be zero. This would be pi. This would be two pi. Right here would be two pi over three. That's 270 degrees. Right here would be pi over two. That's 90 degrees. Uh, this is one unit up and one unit down. Have any of you ever seen anything like this before? Any of you ever seen anything like this before? None of you have? Nobody's ever seen it? Okay. When you study a little bit of trigonometry, this, this is called a sine wave. When you graph, in fact, your calculator will show it to you if you put it in, in radian mode. or well, It doesn't matter whether you're radian degree mode, but you have to be careful about your axis. If you're in radian mode, you want this to be two pi. It'll be 360 degrees. So you, know, you got to pay attention. It'll look weird if you're not in the right mode. But what that means you know, this is this is theta, and this is the sine of theta. So the x-axis is the angle, and the y-axis is the sine of that angle.
And the equation turns out to be y a times the sine of b theta. Now, a and b are two parameters, and they're the only ones that I think you need to know in the ACT. There are actually four parameters in all when you do the trigonometry, but you don't have to worry about that right now. You just need to worry about a and b. And a stands for amplitude. And that's the distance from the line of symmetry, which in this case is the theta axis here, x axis. It could be raised up, but on the ACT, I don't think they're going to do that, or it could be raised down. That's called a vertical displacement. And there could also be a phase shift, which means moving it right or left. But, but on the ACT, I don't think they're going to do that to you. So if you can remember this, this will help you. This is the amplitude. The amplitude, this, this, angle, this graph right here that I've graphed is y equals sine of theta. A is 1 and B is 1 in this one right here. The amplitude is 1. That A is the amplitude. It tells you how high it goes. Yeah, I, could, I could draw another one here. And let's say 1, 2, 3. And I've got the sine wave that goes up to 3. And back down to negative 3. The amplitude would be 3. Amplitude is just how far off the x-axis does it go. What's its maximum? And it goes up to 3, the amplitude is 3. It goes down to negative 3. Distance from the line of symmetry to its highest peak at its lowest trough. So if you increase A, it's got a higher amplitude. Of course, when you work with sound waves, that means it's louder. You know, that, this is the kind of math they do with, to, to do sound waves, any other kind of wave. Okay? B, this is a little misleading here, stands for the period. B is not the period. But B enables you to calculate the period. The period is 2 pi divided by B if you're working with radians, which usually will be. Which means B is 2 pi divided by the period. So in this case, the period is 2 pi. So B is 2 pi divided by 2 pi, which is 1. Let me show you another example here real quickly. If I said, here's a sine wave. They just keep going. And this time... This is uh, this is two uh, yeah this is this is two pi right here so now that may not be the best example let's let's just do this first let's say this is four pi so now this is two pi right here this is pi this is three pi over two I'm sorry that's three pi. All right. Now, the, 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 the period is different. Here it was 2 pi. Over here is 4 pi. So to write that in an equation form, the period is 4 pi, so B would be 2 pi over 4 pi, which is 1 half. So in the equation, you have A equals, I'm sorry, not A, Y. Y equals, I'll pretend this is still 1, 1 times the sine of B times theta, but B is a half, so it's one half theta. If I had stretched it out so that now this is pi, this is pi over 2, this is pi over 4, this is 3 pi over 4, now the period is pi. So B would be 2 pi divided by the period, which would be 2. 2 pi divided by pi is 2. So this equation is y equals sine of 2 theta, assuming this is 1. If I, if I made the amplitude bigger, let's say it's 2 this time, negative 2 this time, then this will be 2, 2 sine of 2 theta. So the 2 out front is the, and the, a is the amplitude, and it tells you how high and how low it goes. And the 2 inside here, the number that multiplies theta, the, 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 the thing that you're multiplying theta by, helps you calculate the period because... That number is going to be 2 pi divided by the period. And you can find the period by dividing 2 pi by that number. It be 2 in this case. Okay, that's a really crash course in sine waves. And it's a very important part of trigonometry. And they might ask you one or two questions about sine waves on the test. Uh, I've got a couple of them. 
So here's one. Now, can you look at that and tell me what the period is? Based on what I just said. What is the period? Can anybody remember it? Based on what I just said, were you totally confused? Just tune me out. <laughs> okay. The period is the distance along the x-axis, the theta axis, until it completes a cycle. When one complete cycle happens, you, you've covered a period. So what's the period? No. The period is going this way. And, and here is a complete cycle. See, here's one cycle up and down and back to where it began. That's one cycle. That's one period. Here's another period. Up and, back, and, back, and it just keeps going. You can go both to the left and to the right, but it looks the same. It's called a sine wave. But the period here is 2 pi. That's where it completes the first cycle. Does it make sense? You see it? The period is 2 pi, where it completes the first cycle. The period is 2 pi. What's the amplitude of this one? 3. It goes up to 3. It goes down to negative 3. But there are 3 units right here. From the, from the axis to the peak. So the amplitude is 3. Now, do you remember the equation, the basic equation, y equals what? Do you remember? A times the sine of B theta. That's the equation. The amplitude is just that number. It's just straight out of it. So the amplitude is 3. And B, you calculate from this. Do you remember the formula for B? It's 2 pi. Yeah, 2 pi over the period. And the period this time is 2 pi. So B is 1. So A is 3. B is 1. That's what you need to write the equation. So you write Y equals 3 times the sine of 1 times theta. 3 times the sine of theta. That's the equation of this line. I realize when you first see it, it may look like a lot of gobbledygook, but it's really... Just learning the amplitude and the period is not too too hard. I think you can figure this out on the ACT with that with this kind of information here. So y equals a times the sine of b theta is the equation. B is two pi over the period, so it's three sine theta. One more like that. What's the period this time? Yep, one pi. What's the amplitude? Still 3. And, and it's the same equation, y equals a sine b theta, but this time b is 2 pi divided by pi, which would be 2. Mm -hmm. So it's 3 sine 2 theta. That's it. So if you can remember that, it, it, could, it could help you through a problem like this. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether to ask you to do that or not. Maybe I don't even want to mess with it because that's that's a little bit complex. It really is. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things about it, but we won't we won't worry too much about it, I guess. But first of all, they're saying the value of sign is negative point seven nine eight. Which of the following could be true about theta? Okay. First of all, if you remember in this unit circle. They're all positive up here, so the sign is positive up here. The sign is also positive over here, because it's opposite over hypotenuse. But the sign is negative down here. Well, this is a negative number. So now, wait a minute, this is 0 to the power of 3. That's, that's like, like from here to maybe here or something. This is power of 3 to 2 power of 3, which is going to take me over here somewhere. So these both have signs that are positive because they're in the first and second quadrants. So this says its sign is negative. So even if you couldn't do any more, you could throw out a couple of bad answers. Now these all three have negative signs. Um... <clears throat> If you, I'm not going to go through this. I feel like I'm overwhelming you now, but you could change each of these to decimals with your calculator. 
just change them to decimals, punch it in your calculator, and change the decimals, and then take the sign of these things, and, and you'll get an idea maybe of whether that's in the range or not. It's just one way you could do it. Um, you can also, your calculator will do this too. You can take the inverse sign of this number, make sure you're in radian mode, inverse sign of that number, and you can get a an angle. But you remember, you're not just comparing these numbers with that. You're comparing the sign of that number with this number with those. So, anyway, uh, that's probably enough said about that. <clears throat> So it's in corner three or four. I already said that. Eliminate A and B. Okay. Here, here's another way you could do it. You could have yourself a sine wave and, and plot these points roughly, figure out where they are because it's only using three, two pi over three, five pi over four, seven pi over four. And then you could figure out where it's most likely to be. It's sine is negative 0 0.798. So negative 0 0.798 be down here somewhere. So it looks like it's probably going to be between those two right there. The sign is negative. Yep. Okay. That's that's a very advanced. That's one of the most advanced math problems you'll get on the ACT. That's a real ACT question. Okay. And I said you could test this by putting in the calculator. You get negative point seven oh seven. That would be right here, and it's a little bit lower than that. So. I'm going to choose D, which is between those two numbers. Okay, enough of that. Uh, here's another one, kind of advanced. This is cosine, but, and I haven't talked about cosine. <clears throat> but as far as this is concerned, it's, it, you, can, you, can, you can think of it just like a sign. It follows the same rules. The only difference with the cosine and the sine, I'll tell you this real quickly, is the cosine starts here instead of here. It comes down, back up. And, you know, it looks just like a sign. It says it starts in a different place. So it completes its cycle at 2 pi also. Down and back up. But it's, it's like shifted to the left or to the right, you know, before you want to look at it. But you don't have to worry about that here. Think about what I told you about this, this basic equation. When I said y equals a times the sine of b theta, it's also true that y equals a times the cosine of b theta. It's exactly the same thing. So with that much information and what I've said, can you can you try to come out with what you think might look like an answer or at least which ones might look like wrong answers? You know, the question is about period and amplitude. Let me let you think about it for a minute. Try to think about it. Let's see if you can if you followed some of what I've said, see if you can figure that one out. This will be our last day of this more advanced stuff, so just hang with me here because we're about done with it. Have, have any of you eliminated any of them yet? Is, are there some of them you can say, well, I know it's not that one. Can you do that? You think C is not right? Okay. You're right. It's not right. Do you, do you have a reason for that? Okay. The half looks weird for B uh, because up there in the original one, the, the period is obviously 2 pi because B in the on top, Y equals cosine of X, uh, has a period of 2 pi. So it's got to have the same period. So that one half X, you got to throw it out. Okay. 
No, it's not. Um, I appreciate your guessing, but it's not right. The, the period would be right for E. But the amplitude is not right for E. What's the amplitude? It's D. It's D. It's D. Yeah, the amplitude is 3. That's the number out front of the cosine here, the amplitude. This, this is amplitude is 1. This amplitude is 1. This amplitude is 3. This amplitude is 3. And this amplitude is 1. So I've got 2 here with amplitude to 3. But it has the same period, so it needs to be cosine of x, not cosine of half x. So that's got to be it. You say, what about that 1? Well, I told you a while ago there were actually more than just those two parameters. That's one of the x's. That's called a vertical shift. It, it, it raises it up one unit. But that doesn't really relate to this problem, except to maybe confuse you. But y'all, you need to look, look at the cosine. There's a phase shift and a vertical displacement that, that can happen. Okay. If you can remember some of that, it can help you get some of the more advanced problems right. I think that's, you know, reasonable for you to learn if you really want to try to get that amplitude and period thing worked out. And now I'm done with trigonometry. There's one more problem here. It's kind of an offbeat problem. Uh, but they, they would consider it a more advanced problem. But I think you could come up with an answer for this. Let's see if you can. Work on that one for a little while. You may need to draw that on your paper. Think about it a little bit. And the one they've drawn there, I'll warn you, is not, in my mind, is not to scale. I mean, you know, it, it looks wider than it does deep to me the way they've drawn it there. But they're saying, oh, well, you can, you can work on it. You think it's G uh, for coordinates for B? Uh, that's not what I'm getting, but 
Maybe I'm not thinking straight myself. I haven't seen this problem in a long time. So. <clears throat> Anybody get anything different? <clears throat> Let's look at it together for a minute here. First of all, I'm going to pretend. Let's see. I can use this. We're going to, we're going to, behind this thing, you know, there's a, there's an origin back there. So if I plot all these points, Zero two zero, and I may not be sure at first how far to the right this thing goes. Of course, I'm not. But I know it's coming out four units. So this one right here is four something something, and since it's not going up, the z is zero. So that's four something zero. That's this point down here. This point right here, x is zero, y is something. And Z is something. This point up here, <clears throat> X is zero. It's not coming out from the, just like this one down here. <clears throat> oh, and uh, Z is zero here too. Then. But it's not going up. But here I got three points, but X is zero. Back here, x is 0, y is 0, and z is some number. I'm, I'm doing all that to try to help you visualize what's going on here. Out here, this is 4 still. It's coming out 4 units. <clears throat> uh, y is 0 here, but z is some number. What is 0 here? x, y, or z? None of them. You're coming out from the y-axis, you're coming up from the, for the z-axis, and you're coming, I'm sorry, out for the x-axis and to the right for the y-axis. So none of them are zero. Up here, every one of them has a zero in it except this one. <clears throat> so this must be 4x. Of course, that makes sense because this is 4, <clears throat> and it's the front face, out 4. And it must be 2 units to the right for y. And two units up for zero to Z. <clears throat> and that's why I cautioned you at the beginning that I thought this thing didn't look like uh, proportional. I mean, if this is four units, you ought to think this is probably more, but this is two units. From here to here is only two units. So they didn't draw it quite right. Two identical smaller cubes, and because here I think I drew this for if I remember correctly. Let me look and see. Yeah, see that's the way they should have drawn it <clears throat> to make it look like this is longer. So that that drawing throws you off. <clears throat> but the two cubes would be from here to here would be two units. See, we should be like. And that doesn't look like anything like two cubes. It looks like two boxes, maybe, but not two cubes. But it, it should be four units here, two units here, and two units here. <clears throat> so that's, a, that's considered a more advanced math question because it's just confusing. Uh, it involves three dimensions. Uh, and I, I think that's probably, in case of you seeing one like that, it may be slim to none, but... but uh, they can throw stuff like that in on you, and that, that's considered advanced math. Okay. So next time I want to go back and cover just a few more math fundamental stuff that, that you'll be more familiar with. Probably a little more pleasant, <laughs> if you can ever call math pleasant. Okay. Anything else? 
you want to say? Okay. Father, thank you for the kids keeping a good attitude today. And I know we've been covering things that are more challenging. I just feel like I need to cover all the stuff that I can that uh, I think might show up on the ACT. So I pray you encourage them and uh, help them not to be too panicky. I know these problems will be kind of rare when they show up, but they do occasionally. So uh, help them not to be shocked by it. And if some of them would just pay a little more attention, Lord, they could, I mean, maybe work on this a little bit more and spend some time on it. They could, uh, they could figure some of these two problems out. So pray you encourage them. Pray you help us the rest of this day to walk with you. I pray you help us to bring you glory. I hope you help us to represent you well. We want to be Christ-like. We want to be gracious and kind and patient, loving, gentle. We want to be like Jesus. So help us, please. We know we can't do that apart from your Holy Spirit filling us and working through us. So please do that and uh, get glory any way you please. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.